All right, you made it to concept three notes. We are gonna learn about limiting reactants. And you guys, it's really only two things left to learn how to do in this concept. So you can do it, we're at the very, very end. These are the last two things. And I'm gonna walk you through every step of it, okay? So in class, we're gonna start with a little activity um, so that we can kind of learn this first before we take the notes on it with s'mores. And I was laughing as I put this in because I'm like, wow, this is now the third activity in this unit that involves food. So I think we're just like eating our feelings as we learn all this math. And I think I'm trying to use a lot of sugar to, you know, soften the blow of all the quantitative things that you're having to do. But hopefully all of the sugary things that you're getting to work with and ingest in this unit is making you enjoy stoic stoichiometry a little bit more. And hopefully you'll look back on this unit of stoic and it'll be a lot sweeter if you know what I mean. Okay. So let's learn these last two things though. Let's talk limiting reactants. So you can only make as much product in a chemical reaction as the reactants that you have. Once one reactant is used up, no more product can be formed, even if you still have the other reactant. Okay, so think about this. Like, think about right now. If you walked into my pantry, I've got like a, you know, a jar of peanut butter. It's probably three quarters of the way full. So there's a lot in it. And then I've got a jar of jelly, brand new jar of jelly. But I only have four pieces of sandwich bread. So I can only make two full sandwiches of peanut butter jelly. It doesn't matter how much peanut butter and jelly I have. I only have that much bread. So I can only make as much product as the limited amount of reactant that I have. And the bread is what is limiting here, me here. If I had more bread, I can make more sandwiches, okay? That's all we're talking about here in chemistry. So the limiting reactant is just the reactant that limits the amount of product that can be made. It's what gets used up first and thus can make the least amount of product possible. So we're gonna determine how much product we can make based on the limiting reactant. I will know how many PB&Js I can make for my kids at lunch today based on how much bread I have because that bread is my limiting reactant. The excess reactant or reactants, if there's multiple in ingredients here, is the reactant that just isn't completely used up in the reaction. Thus you have excess or you have leftovers of this one. So when I'm done making my PB&Js for my kids' lunches today, I'm gonna have excess peanut butter and jelly. I'll have leftovers of those that I can use the next time I get more bread to make more PB&Js, okay? So we're, gonna, we're literally just talking about PB&Js here. We're just gonna now take it and talk about like, carbon dioxide and water and chemicals, okay? But the exact same thing. So how do you identify limiting versus excess, okay? It's obviously easy if I've got all the ingredients in front of you, you can just look at them and figure it out. But like if we're doing a problem on paper, how do we do that? Well, I think the best way to teach you this is just to show you as an example. So let's do one. Consider the following reaction. All right, so we have dinitrogen um, tetrahydride liquid. It's gonna react with um, hydrogen peroxide and it's gonna make nitrogen gas and water vapor. It's already balanced, we can see, so we can just go ahead and dive in here because we have our balanced reaction, which remember, we need that balanced reaction for mole ratios. So let's say we have six moles of this starting ingredient and 4.50 moles of this starting ingredient. Which one's gonna limit how much of this product I can make? Okay, so here is what you do. First, let's write what we know as always. We know 6.00 moles. We know 4.50 moles. Okay, now we want to know how much product we can make. Now, here's where you can not kind of just, just pick a product. It doesn't matter which one in this situation, just pick one to work off of. So I'm just going to work with the nitrogen gas because it's right there. And we're going to need some mole ratios here so we can compare these. So I can look at this and see, well, there's one mole of dinitrogen tetrahydride for every one mole of nitrogen gas made. And there's two moles of hydrogen peroxide for every one mole of nitrogen gas made. So even just looking right here, I can see I'm gonna need twice as much hydrogen peroxide as I need dinitrogen tetrahydride in order to do this. But let's keep working this out for the sake of understanding. Okay, so start with what we have. We have six moles of dinitrogen tetrahydride. I wanna know like how much nitrogen gas can I even make with this? Well, one mole of that for every one mole of nitrogen gas. If I were gonna use up all six moles of this, I could make six moles of nitrogen gas. All right, but now let's look at the hydrogen peroxide. I've got four moles of that. Well, two moles of hydrogen peroxide are for every one mole of nitrogen gas. Those cancel if I multiply across the top and multiply across the bottom and divide. I can only make, with what I have, I can only make 2.25 moles of nitrogen gas. So looking at these, 
Which one is going to limit how much nitrogen gas we can make? Our hydrogen peroxide. So therefore, hydrogen peroxides are limiting reacting because when you compare these, this one can make a lot more nitrogen gas than this one. So this is going to be our limiting factor. This is our sandwich bread here, whereas this is like our PB and J or peanut butter and jelly. Okay, now. Another question I could ask you after I ask you which reactant is limiting, I could say like, okay, well then like how much of the leftover reactant am I going to have? How much of the excess reactant is going to be unused? Okay, so remember we're starting with this much of each of our substances. Now, I know based on this, I can only make a maximum of 2.25 moles of nitrogen gas. That's all I can make. Okay, so that's what I know that's going to be made. I know these mol that mole ratio. What I want to figure out now is if I'm going to make this much nitrogen gas, how much of my excess reactant, dinitrogen tetrahydride, do I need to do that? So we're just going to go the other direction. So if I'm going to make that much, how much dinitrogen tetrahydride can that make? Well, I'm going to need this. I'm going to need 2.25 moles of this. But remember, I have 6 moles. So if I have 6 and I only need this much to make my 2.25 moles of nitrogen gas, you just need to subtract. And I see that I have 3.75 moles of this unused. Okay? The last thing I could ask you with this is how much of each product in moles is formed? And I'm going to figure that out based on my limiting reactant. Okay? So 2.25 moles of nitrogen gas. I already under or highlighted this because we already did this. We already figured out how much limiting reactant hydrogen peroxide can make of this. So we don't need to calculate that all over again. You've already done this. So now I just need to figure out how much water can I be made, and I'm going to use my limiting reactant to figure that out. So I know I have that much of my limiting reactant. I know that there's two moles of hydrogen peroxide for every four moles of water, and I want to know how many moles of water. So now this is just, you know, a problem like we did in concept two. I've got four moles of hydrogen peroxide. I've got two, two moles of that for every four moles of water. Those cancel out. Multiply across the top and the bottom, divide, and I'm going to make two moles of water from my limiting reactant. Okay? Now you try this with a neighbor. Same exact questions I've asked you in the last example we did, just different equation. And then I added one more. I added one extra step here. I said, now how much of each product in grams is formed? So really, if I'm asking, I get you already found it in moles. Now all you need to do is get your molar masses and convert these to grams. That's just taking it one step further. I wanted to make sure you saw how to do it every way that you can see it, okay? So we'll go over this in class, and then we're gonna do a lot of practice with this, but I have one more thing I need to teach you before we go, and that's percent yield. We've actually talked about this before in a previous unit because this is a calculation that's gonna come up a lot in the labs that we do. So remember, percents just compare, you know, typically like parts to whole, or they just compare ratios of things. So you have something called your actual yield. This is what you actually make in a chemical reaction, like in a lab. This is the measured amount of product that's actually made. The theoretical yield is what you could have made if everything went perfectly. This is the maximum amount of product you could have made from a given reactant. This is something we calculate from the chemical equation. The percent yield just compares the two. So percent yield is just the actual divided by the theoretical times 100. And it'll let you know, like, I, you made 90% of what you could have made. You made 50% of what you could have made, okay? So let's say theoretically, with my PB&J ingredients I already mentioned to you, I could make two full PB&Js, but I actually only end up making one. Well, one divided by two times is 0.5 times 100 is 50%. So my percent yield is I made 50% of what I actually could have made with the ingredients I had, okay? That's all we're doing. Okay, so let's do an example. Consider photosynthesis, which is I wrote out here below for you. You've got 45.7 grams of water reacted with an excess of carbon dioxide. So pause right here. If I go ahead and tell you 45.7 grams of water and an excess of carbon dioxide, that means I'm already telling you water is our limiting reactant here. So we're going to use water to figure out our theoretical yield. Okay, I already did that first step for you. Now, I tell you the actual yield is 32.8 grams of glucose, C6H12O6. I want to know what's the percent yield of glucose. We'll go back. Percent yield, we need the actual and theoretical. So we got to figure out, they gave us the actual. we got to figure out what's the theoretical yield. How much could we have made if everything went perfectly? Okay, so what do we know? We know that we have 45.7 grams of water, and we know this is our limiting reactant because we they straight up told us in the problem. We know that 32.8 grams of glucose is what's actually made in this reaction. We need to know the theoretical yield of glucose and so that we can find the percent yield. Okay, so 
What else are we probably going to need to know here? Well, we're going to go grams, and then we're going to have to convert to moles. So we're going to need to know like molar mass. We're going to need to know molar ratio to get all the way to like our grams here. So we're basically looking at your mole map. We're going all the way across left to right here on our mole map. So we need the ratio here. We've got six moles of water for every one mole of glucose, and then we're going to need our molar masses. So let's find our molar mass of water first, which is 18.016 grams per mole. Okay, now. Let's go ahead and I guess I'm gonna, the way I worked this out is we're gonna go ahead and start converting that. Did I do this all in one slide? I think I did. All right, 45.7 grams of water. We know we have, this is our molar mass of water. Now I got moles of water, okay? Now, let's move on to the next slide. We've got 2.54 moles of water, let's keep going, okay? I added that to our list of things we know. Now let's find the molar mass of glucose now that we've got more room. So that's a little bit bigger here. So the molar mass of glucose is 180.16 grams per mole. All right, now, again, let's move it to another slide. We need so much room for this. Now here, let's list everything we figured out so far. We got our 2.5 moles of water, okay? Now let's convert it. We know there's six moles of water for every one mole of glucose. That mole ratio comes from right here. Those cancel. And then I know the molar mass of glucose. We just figured it out. So those will cancel. And now I know... If I multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, divide. All right, now I have my theoretical yield of glucose. Now we just got to plug it in for percent yield. So percent yield is actual over theoretical. So the actual, which was given to us, over the theoretical, which you just calculated, times 100. And that gives us 43.7%. So we made 43% 43.7% of what we actually could, like we theoretically could have made if everything went perfectly. Okay, so now you try it here with this problem. And this equation, and then we're gonna do some practice. And guys, that's it. Everything you need to know from what is arguably considered our scariest unit, but you can totally do this. I believe in you.